Um, I want to start off by uh, thanking everyone for being here and inviting me to be here. I've been to many Creative Mornings and I love it and it's a total honor to be here. So hopefully I can inspire you the way these talks have inspired me before. So I want to start off by talking about this quote. Courage is the art of being the only one who knows you're scared to death. So this is a quote that I chose to put next to my uh, graduating portrait in my yearbook coming out of high school. Uh, just so you think I'm not playing around with you. Um, there it is. So <clears throat> I think when I chose this quote at the time, which was 11 years ago, I was about 17, it was in high school. And when you're in high school, you sort of have this inner self versus outer self battle. And I think everyone can relate to that. So at the time, I thought this meant Conceal your fears, that's courage. Conceal your fears, conceal vulnerability, because whenever you put yourself out there, it's rejected, right? You're reprimanded for it, or your friends think you're crazy, or you get bullied, or whatever. And obviously, I think very differently about this quote now. So, given that you're working on an inner self versus an outer self battle, I mean, that takes a lot of energy. You're two people at the same time. And when you're doing that, you don't really know who you are. So you have low self-esteem, you know, you have a distorted self-image, uh, you might be overly sensitive. And when you're a teenager, all that stuff is just like rushing through you with hormones and classmates and applying to universities. So it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized uh, through a lot of therapy that a lot of these problems are things that I could understand or I could get help with. And it was brought to my attention through therapy that I might have borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is not bipolar, but we'll get into that later. So around 17, 18, 19 was when I started to fall apart on the inside. And I went through this like really ridiculous breakup. I caught someone cheating on me, it was awful, it was the first time I was in love or I thought I was in love. And after that I was a mess, like I was a total mess. Um, I was having anxiety attacks every day and I didn't know what they were because I'd never had them before. And if you don't know what an anxiety attack is like, I can tell you what mine are like. So it kind of starts like around my butt, it starts in, in my ass cheeks <laughs> and they get all tingly and cold and weird and then that triggers my gut. And my gut says, oh my god, something terrible is about to happen. And that triggers my heart. And then my heart rate skyrockets, which causes my brain to say, you're going to die of a heart attack right now. This is the end of the world. And then I'm gasping for air and I'm hyperventilating. And then that's when panic, panic sets in, which some people will know as panic attacks or anxiety attacks. And these are fairly common. But I didn't really understand that at the time. And I was coping with these in a really violent way. Uh, when I was in panic mode, I would bash my head against the wall, I would bite into my arm or my skin somewhere, I would punch my legs because I just wanted to feel something else. When you're in panic mode, there's just, it's so hard to get out of it, you don't really see clearly. So I went to my family physician and I told her this, I said I need to talk to someone, this isn't right, there's something wrong with me, I'm crying all the time, there's no way that this guy meant enough to me for me to like destroy my life. And she said, oh no problem, here's a piece of paper, on it are two prescriptions, one for an antidepressant called Cirpalex, which I was on for years and did fuck all, and then two, <laughs> uh, an anti-anxiety drug which would help me reach rock bottom a few years later. So let's think about that for a second. I came across this um, on StatsCan, and in 2012 they did this huge mental health uh, survey. So counseling was the most common type of mental health care need cited by Canadians aged 15 and over. It was also least often reported as met, but medication was less often reported as a need, but was reported most often as met. And that's a problem, and that's a problem with our mental health care system. So at the time when I received these uh, medications, I wasn't aware of what kind of power she was giving me. And the drug she gave me is called Ativan. And Ativan is a potent benzodiazepine. It causes um, kind of like a euphoric sensation, which as you can imagine is delicious and addictive. 
It uh, is a sedative as well, so if you've had your wisdom teeth out, they may have given it to you to relax you and put you out. Um, but the problem with Ativan is that it is widely prescribed. So this is from 1987, and it says, in a world where certainties are few, no wonder Ativan is, is prescribed by so many caring clinicians. So I get this pill, and I'm supposed to take it as needed when I have anxiety or I'm reaching that panic mode. And I did that for a while. And I didn't know any of this at the time, but it is a very highly addictive drug. And one of its side effects is that it can induce suicidal thoughts. Um, so for, let's say, four or five years, I was taking it three, four times a week. But in those few years, I was going through a lot of changes. I moved around a lot. I went to Switzerland. I went to Montreal. I went to Whistler. I had a string of failed relationships. And of course, none of these failed relationships helped because I kept thinking, everyone's leaving me. I'm crazy. Everyone's leaving me. I'm crazy. And I'm taking this medication, which is also not helping because I'm not dealing with the root of my problem, which was you know, my self-image and my inner self versus my outer self. So things slowly got darker and darker. And around that time, I was in this relationship that uh, he had uh, a lot of the same friends as I did, and we would go out with these friends. And when I, when I was out with these supposed friends, I'd have these anxiety attacks, so I'd have to excuse myself and take care of them. And that wasn't right. Um, I'm going to read you something that I wrote around that time, and it's kind of dark, so don't be scared. <laughs> so this was written on March 8, 2010. It's difficult, it seems. I'm stuck between two layers of madness. One is an obvious insanity, the other more subtle. People tend to witness the lesser of two, but I'm well aware of the severity of the crazier layer. I'm also aware that even though I have days when myself is not quite myself and actually something else, I must still live, as though I'm living without a soul. And I'm aware that on those days, I must keep living, even if I feel no attachment to this world, that I have to keep breathing and moving, even if I don't feel alive. I'm aware of it all. And that alone is enough to drive one to madness. But it's quite impossible to describe it to anyone who hasn't been so severely depressed. So here we go. We're stalked by an invisible villain, his hand over our mouths. We can't tell anyone about it justly. We can't scream for help. And we walk around with him alone in fear all the time that one day a gun will come out of his pocket or a knife or he'll toss us off a building and we'll die. But then some of us don't even live in fear after a while. We accept the villain. We welcome him. We make it easy for him to kill because we have no fight left. And it's fairly obvious now that living without fear seems to be as good as being dead. So that was around the stage that I was giving up. <laughs> and uh, it was a pretty tough time because I wanted help, but it wasn't there. So I was just giving up. And I was really addicted to this Ativan. And the more you take it, the more you need, and the more suicidal you feel. So one day, that was it. I gave up. I went to a couple different walk-in clinics. I said, oh, hey, look, I'm uh, taking Ativan for anxiety, but I'm not seeing my doctor for a while. Can you give me a prescription? Said the same thing to another clinician. Went to two different pharmacies. And there you have it. I had a lot of Ativan at my disposal. So that night, I was having a sleepover at my best friend's place, and I felt pretty good. I was you know, calm, I was resolved, I knew it would all be over soon. I woke up in the morning, and the first thing I did, the moment I opened my eyes, was I started crying. I was in so much pain, just unbearable amount of pain, and I just opened my eyes. Nothing had even happened yet. So that was it. I went to the bathroom, I took out my pills, and I took them all. And I woke up in the hospital. So I'll never get that day back. I have no idea what happened in that 24-hour span. But I woke up in the hospital with a psychiatric nurse there giving me my options. And um, I spent six weeks in this hospital program that uh, involved occupational therapy, cognitive therapy, a psychiatrist, a social worker. And I thought, holy shit, is this all I needed to do to get help? Um, so there I am in the hospital with all this help that's suddenly available to me. So as my time in the hospital was ending, um, I had learned a lot about myself. And it was brought to my attention uh, 
borderline personality disorder. To be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, you have to have five or more of the following traits. And the five that I'm highlighting here are the ones that I have. So extreme reactions to abandonment, obviously. Intense and stormy romantic relationships, yep. Distorted and unstable self-image, probably since I was about 13. Recurring suicidal tendencies, absolutely. Intense and highly changeable moods. Chronic feelings of emptiness and boredom. Well, that explains why I moved around a lot and changed my major three times and who the hell else knows. So I started to learn more and more about myself and how I can help myself, which is, of course, really great. But I was also terrified because I was, like my time with the hospital was coming to an end and I didn't have a counselor, I didn't have a psychiatrist, and psychologists are very expensive. So I was really nervous and I put myself on a bunch of wait lists for a counselor, which can be upwards of two years. But there was nothing. And I get out of the hospital and there I am on my own. And I'm avoiding downtown Ottawa completely. Why? Because I didn't want to run into anyone I knew, and especially not those people that I knew during that hard time that never asked how I was, never visited me, nothing. Those were not my friends, and I didn't want to run into them and face it and tell them, okay, I'm crazy, and I've been hiding it from you for however many years. So I avoided downtown for about six months completely. And eventually I got over that. I started to apply the lessons I learned in the hospital, which was to change my thinking. And a lot of what I learned was that we have two parts of our mind. We have the reasonable mind, we have the emotional mind. And then, you know, there's in the middle of this, the wise mind that plays devil's advocate. And it puts the two together and makes sense of everything. You know, if you only have an emotional mind, you're going to make compulsive decisions. If you only have a reasonable mind, you know, you're not going to have any empathy or compassion. So it's important to have the two. And I was always able to give advice to people, but I couldn't apply that to myself. So that's what I started to do. Whenever I had a problem, I said, what would my friends tell me? You know, my good friends, my close friends, what advice would they give me? I'm going to give that to myself. So that's what I started to do. And I got over it and I started to head out with friends again. And I started working in film and television and I was working really long hours. And then I met a friend and he sort of helped me I guess reintroduced myself to like the, the scene in Ottawa and I was out partying a lot. And then I looked at my life and I realized I'm working 20 hour days. Sometimes I'm out partying until 3.30 in the morning even though I have to be on set at 6 or 7 a.m. And I'm in this like casual relationship that makes me feel like crap. What am I doing? So I started crying and I went and I approached my friend that I'd been hanging out with a lot and that friend is Pat Balduke who you know as uh, the co-founder of Herd Magazine. And so I approached him and I said, I can't do this anymore, you know, like, what the hell am I doing with my life? I am not writing anymore. I work all the time. It's not creative. Um, I hate this guy I'm with. What the hell am I doing? So that was it. Ended the relationship. Him and I started talking about the magazine. I said, is Ottawa ready for an arts and culture magazine? He said, totally. So we got to brainstorming. And as soon as we started brainstorming, like my, I just stopped crying. The tears stopped. And I will always remember this, he said, I think we found your project. I think we found it. And I said, okay, let's do it. So that's what happened, is we started Herd Magazine. And what's interesting is right around that time that we started Herd Magazine, I was starting to accept myself and be myself in front of people. And all of a sudden my relationships, you know, my quality of friendships were better. Um, I started to trust people more. But what was really interesting was that I was still on this wait list for counseling and they called me and they said, oh, it's another six months. I was like, okay, well, screw you. And then I put my name on a wait list for a psychiatrist who called me around the time that we started Herd Magazine. And I thought to myself, why is it that when I was willing to give up and I didn't want to help myself, that there was all this help for me all of a sudden, but yet I'm seeking it for about a year and a half. And there's no help for me in the system. There's just nothing. I looked at community centers, you know, and there's, there's some groups, which is great, but the scheduling was tough. It's just, it's, there's just no help for you unless you're on the brink of destruction. So while the mental health care system may have failed me, 
as fate would have it, around the time that Herd Magazine started, um, the psychiatrist gave me a call because he had a cancellation. And since then, I've been seeing him for about a year and a half, and he also does talk therapy. So he monitors my medication, we get to chat, and I'm off the anxiety meds that's been like done for years. And I also have the magazine, which gives me a creative outlet. And I guess what I take from all of this is, I guess courage is more so embracing your fears or accepting them, and then doing something productive with them, right? I mean, you can dwell on things all you want, but the only person who's gonna help you is you. You can make excuses and say that you've been on wait lists for a long time, but it's not until you take that first step that things are actually going to change. So it's important to be yourself, because until you're yourself, you won't have the energy to actually be productive, because you're just putting energy into being two different people at the same time. And um, tonight we're celebrating our one year anniversary, although technically our real anniversary is October 19th. Um, Pat and Joey are here. Can you guys stand up for a second? And I encourage everyone to approach them and ask them questions. <laughs> Joey is our creative director. He's responsible for making the magazine as pretty and crazy looking as it is. And Pat's our photo guru and co-founder. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess the moral of the story is be brave enough to be yourself. <laughs> Okay, great, that's an awesome question, actually. Um, so when I say, like, when it seems like I'm demonizing pharmaceuticals, I'm really not. Uh, but I do believe in putting the two together, so talk therapy and working on yourself and being positive and changing the way you think, as well as medication. I, I myself, I'm still on medication. Um, it's just a lesser evil <laughs> of a medication. Um, but I've been on all sorts of medications, antipsychotics and so on. But um, I do think that, you know, like a pill's not gonna treat you. A pill isn't the answer to everything. Um, and also, I do think that it's important to know what you're taking um, because there are side effects. There's a lot of um, addictive drugs out there that are easily <laughs> prescribed, which really pisses me off. But um, no, definitely, I, I, don't, I don't advise to never go on medication if you think that that's what you need, but also it's a trial and error process. I mean, I tried a lot of medications, and now I'm on one that has very few side effects, and I'm functional, and I'm still myself, right? So, it's a it's a trial and error process for sure. Oh, hi. I just want to thank you very much. That's uh, it's hard to get up and be vulnerable like that. And, and thank you. I'd love to hear more. You and I think all of us. And I'm curious to know from a creative standpoint how your how your mental state influences positively or negatively your 
your creativity. I find um, <laughs> yeah. sometimes as a designer and working with designers, you walk into studios, you hear music, you hear nothing. Uh, you're in a good mood, you're in a bad mood. Um, you're feeling good about yourself or you're feeling down. And, and the work that we produce as designers, writers, photographers is sometimes very influenced by how we're feeling about ourselves as a reflection. So I'm curious to know how that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say that in the darkest periods, I probably wrote the most that I ever had. Um, mind you, that might have been because I was avoiding people and I didn't have anything else to do. But uh, yeah, definitely it influences you. And I don't know, if you're in a good mood and you're in a bad mood, you're going to see the world differently. That's just how it is. So your work is going to be different. Um, but the, the point is, is to be productive with whatever mood that is, right? So roll with it. If you're feeling like shit, don't make other people feel like shit, but just do good work and uh, you know, put it somewhere. Put that shit somewhere, <laughs> I guess is what I mean. Um, but no, it, it does, it definitely influences. I mean, there's a reason why a lot of artists are introverts. Um, and there's something to be said for introverts when they share their work with people because you know, it's very intimate and you can see the intimacy and the personal sentiment behind work that has been put forward by an introvert. So I think it's important to follow those emotions and use your work as an outlet for those emotions, um, but not to make other people miserable in the process. <laughs> Actually, not even to say to this crowd, what are the action steps that people on the outside can take to just recognize and then help? Okay, well, that's a good question because um, I, I've had many anxiety attacks around people and there were no signs because I'm working so hard at concealing it. Now that's different. Now I will just straight up tell people <laughs> I'm freaking out. But uh, yeah, I mean, one thing I learned from the hospital with anxiety attacks was to squeeze ice cubes in my hands because it grounds you. It feels like pain, but it's not causing any harm. So I tell people that. Um, you know, if I'm freaking out, please don't take it personally. You know, I am not good at regulating my emotions. Uh, one of the signs, I guess, for me is being short with people or, or withdrawing completely. Um, so the best thing to do, I guess, for me is not to baby me so that I can snap out of it, but don't patronize my illness. Don't say, snap out of it. Don't say, oh, it's fine. Don't say, just go exercise and it's OK, because it's not that easy. Um, but again, it's my job to tell those close to me what I'm going through so that they're prepared and they have the tools to work through that. Yes. I think so. I get to this generous talk. Uh, congratulations on your bravery. Uh, Thank you. I was <laughs> wondering if you could perhaps elaborate a bit more on the actual process of starting a magazine, especially dealing with such complicated emotions. How is that going? Is that drive going? Uh, I guess the actual process of starting a magazine, the funding, and how you really just put this fantastic endeavor together. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that day that I was crying to Pat, um, it was about two weeks later that he registered us as a legal partnership in Ontario. And from then on, it was about finding a designer, uh, finding contributors' content, researching content, and advertising. Advertising, we rely heavily on advertising, so we're privately funded. Pat put some seed money into the company, and the rest has been advertising. Um, it is very hard. I haven't had a full-time job since the magazine started, and the magazine doesn't pay me, so uh, that's tough. And what keeps us going, or at least I can speak for myself, is that I get to do things like this. I get to engage in the community, whereas two or three years ago, I was avoiding this all the time. Um, and I meet interesting people all the time, so that's key. I think that um, being a part of a community through this has really helped and seeing the results of that and feeling productive. And I think as long as we feel productive and we feel like we're doing good work and we feel like we're bringing people together, we'll, we will still have that drive regardless of 
you know, funding or time. Um, but putting, putting the magazine together, you know, isn't even the hardest part. It's just kind of organizing ourselves and, yeah, thinking, thinking ahead. That's, that's tough. It's tough to always think, you know, three or four months ahead since we publish every three or four months. Um, and finding advertisers and funding. Funding is an issue, but again, we'll always find a way. Um, because we're independently run and operated, you know, we do everything ourselves. So from printing to publishing to researching to fact-checking, fact designing, it's all you know, done within a very small group of people. So that is a little bit less um, departmentalized than say like a big uh, publication. But yeah, it was really just a, a matter of, okay, we're a registered business, uh, let's approach advertisers who will believe in us, and that's it. Put the content on the pages and go to print. Would you say that the business then, you established it, I can imagine a lot of people are probably coming to you as well, just starting to make it, I guess it can be a, says a lot, Yeah. It's it's really great actually. I mean, we have people coming around all the time asking to contribute or pitching ideas or they just they just want to be a part of it. And that's exactly what we wanted. You know, we just wanted everyone to come together. People who otherwise may not have met, you know, and they're working together and it's just interesting, cool, fun work. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's really great. That's super re rewarding. <laughs> yes, Jane? Um, so what's next? What's the vision for her, Meg? <laughs> I have been informed not to tell you our secrets, or we'll have to kill you. Uh, we have some pretty big ideas. Um, we'd like to incorporate eventually, which would give us the uh, national component so we could do business outside of Ontario legally um, and also bring our online platform nationally. So have the same morals that we have here and that is to support local, to not be lazy and actually get involved and go out and see what's going on in your city, to love your city, to embrace what's right in your backyard. We want to bring those values to other cities in Canada. So, you know, if you are an Ottawan and you're visiting Vancouver and you have no idea where to go or what's interesting in Vancouver, well, there's Heard Vancouver online and you can look at you know, previous articles or uh, people that have been profiled and seek those people out and seek those places out so that you understand what it's like to be a, a local uh, Vancouverite. We're done? Okay. <laughs> oh, yes. I thought I was off the hook there for a second. Extremely brave. Uh, running your own business can be extremely stressful. It is. So do you do you find that sort of now having found the why and you know having that sense of purpose and running the business and everything else, that it actually is a form of medication in and of itself? It is, and it, there, there's actually like a really thin line between it being you know something productive and it being something I'm dependent on. So. If the magazine falls apart, what do I have to lean on, right? Is my self-image, is my confidence, is that all going to crumble with it? That's, that, it's important. So it's important not to be dependent on anything. It doesn't matter if it's drugs or art. Um, you have to be strong enough that if you lose your hands and you can't paint anymore, you're going to be OK. You have to be strong enough that you know, you're suddenly illiterate and you can't write anymore. You have to be OK. Um, but yes, it is a bit of a form of medication. It, it helps me feel productive. And having been in industries before where you're working 20 hour days, yet you don't feel productive at all, it's definitely a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much.